welcome back to Bakewell in the beautiful Peak District National Park for another conversation here with John Butler. Uh, John, um, today's topic is uh, brought to us by one of our viewers on YouTube, Rowan Daly. And I'm simply going to read out uh, their comment. If there are so many people alive right now, then how does what we do as individuals matter in the big picture? Oh, that's a good question. A very good one. It sounds like a real cry from the heart, that, doesn't it? Which must be echoed by millions of perhaps uh, yeah, particularly younger people. It certainly was was in my young life. Well, I must try to answer it, mustn't I? Well, what immediately comes to my mind is that uh, when we first come into this world, we're actually very small, aren't we? A newborn baby, not very big at all, is it? And then what happens? It grows, doesn't it? It gets bigger. This actually is a universal law in everything, isn't it? All life. It gets bigger. So the whole range of our life expands, our experience expands. Our, we learn, our mind broadens and expands. Maybe our depth of our feelings expands also. So it's understandable perhaps that Uh, perhaps that's not always so, that as we grow older, um, we understand more. Yes, I suppose that's, that's a fairly general thing to say. Do you know, let me come back to my own experience, if you'll forgive me, because then I'm speaking from surer ground. And maybe from that uh, we, will, we will get a better answer to this question. Of course, this question really tormented me as a young man. What should I do? And um, at one point, when I was 26, I abandoned a life in business, which didn't seem to me the right thing to do. I went out to South America with the rather vague idea of making the world a better place. I was a farmer and uh, thought I would uh, make the deserts green, grow more food for a hungry world. And after a year or so of attempting to do this, uh, with some small success, but really nothing very much, <laughs> I was sitting on a mountainside and something seemed to say to me to make whole be whole. I know I've told this many times before on these videos, but it really was an important stage in my journey. And so when I came home, I looked for and found a school of meditation. I started to meditate. And almost immediately I began to get this sort of feeling. Wow! Inside me was much more than I'd ever previously imagined. And when we were told in school that spiritual work is all about the individual discovering the universal. Of course, I didn't really understand what that was then. But suppose I got a, began to get a grasp of something bigger than just me. So I started to meditate. And now, 
almost 60 years later, I'm still meditating. And progressively, because it didn't really happen all at once, progressively I began to feel that this meditation was the most important thing I actually did. It's certainly been one of the few things that I've continued to do throughout my life, almost unfailingly, every night and morning since I was first taught as a young man of 26. Has the individual become universal? Well, from a rather lost young man, as I say, really almost obsessed with this question, what on earth am I meant to be doing in this life? Do you know, this morning, from long before dawn this morning, I was sitting in the seat over there where I always sit. I closed my eyes and meditated. And you know, three hours later, almost three hours later, without having had almost any sensation of my body or my thoughts throughout that period. I opened my eyes and I wrote in my notebook infinite completion. infinite completion. So how did I get from that mixed up young man to this? Well, I've lived uh, many years, I've had many different experiences, but the one thing I would really pinpoint in this process is the practice, the daily practice of meditation. And as I've again I've demonstrated many times, one of the best ways to illustrate what meditation does is this. You let go. You see, when my fist is closed, it contains quite a small amount of space, doesn't it? Almost no space at all. Indeed, not much of anything very much can be held within a closed fist. But when I open up my hand like that, it can hold everything, can't it? Without limit. So we go from limit to the unlimited. From what you could call the universal, that, that, I beg your pardon, to the individual, that's me, to the universal. Now, what use is the individual? Well, without repeating myself too much, because we've gone over this many times, the individual is really a product of separate existence. Way back in the beginning, you see, man is whole. Man is a spiritual creature. And he falls from that into, and, and of course in spirit, in this universality, there's not, there's one, isn't it? It's one. Again, just to recap, as it were, this presence that we're sitting in, this stillness, it may be in invisible, but it's also indivisible, isn't it? It cannot be divided. It's one, one universal presence, spiritual presence. And we've already begun to realize that this is what I am when we let go the identity with the John Butler, this 
little old bundle of bones that has not got much longer to live on this earth. <laughs> um, you could say the worldly task is almost done. <laughs> I found home. <laughs> I found that where it all originated. Um, so that really is the answer to your question. You see, the individual is—is is it of use or is it useless? <laughs> is it just an impediment? Is it just a mistake? Is it just an error? A child of darkness was, was Christianity describes a child of sin. Sin being that turning away from home, which is God, which is the universal. See, the lost sheep. So, what use is that? Perhaps it's of no use at all. It's just an impediment. It's just a nuisance, isn't it? <laughs> it, just, it just bungs up the works and makes a mess of the world and, and irritates other people. And <laughs> of questionable use. But, you see, once you, once that individual, by, by grace, good fortune, uh, begins to turn towards something bigger, um, begins this, where to put his foot on the first rung of the ladder. We call the spiritual ascent, and begins to work at uh, at, uh, at on uh, at this process of coming home, of rediscovering what what he actually is. Then, of course, he begins to be of use, even in a little degree even if used to himself. Uh, he begins perhaps to get the, uh, begin to get the idea that that uh, phrase to make whole be whole actually depends on me sorting myself out first before I begin to worry about being of use to other people. Um, and then little by little by little, like a little spark within oneself, the divine spark may begin to grow, begin to grow. And of course, because we all influence each other, don't we? If you're, if you're angry and upset, people around you get caught up in it, don't they? If you're at peace, on the contrary, people feel quieter, feel comforted by your presence. So uh, I have no doubt that, uh, that uh, we are, we affect our surroundings. Gradually, 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 the less of me, the more of God. Because, uh, you see, in discovering the my uselessness, I begin to realize that in submitting myself to this greater being, this greater I am, suddenly you realize there is a higher authority. There's one that knows better than me. As old traditions say, God knows and I do not. Hmm? Now I can't hold the whole, whole world in my hand, but as the old song goes, God holds the whole world in his hand. And as we gradually grow out of what we're not, into what we are, then we begin to realize that I don't, I can never attain perfect completion or infinite completion because it's in the, the death of me, it's in the putting me out of the picture, you see, that without any John Butler in the way, like this morning. Infinite completion. And then you see, you are not 
one of millions and millions and millions of lost souls washing around in this darkness of this world trying to figure out what to do. You're one. One that is complete. If there's no more problems, there's no more death or pain or suffering or poverty or darkness. Infinite completion is the actual fact of the reality that we are. Does that include other people? Well, where is the division? So, to come back to the question, the answer is both what use am I? <laughs> no use as an ego. <laughs> but, but once we begin to get our teeth into something better and begin to grow towards what you may call truth, ah, then we begin to be of use and ultimately we may find the real work and the purpose of our whole mortal existence has been to find this ultimate perfection which embraces all things. So in a, in a nutshell, John, what you're saying is that the answer to being a, a meaningful individual is to remove the individual <laughs> seeking, seeking meaning as a separate entity and just go for the bigger picture. <laughs> when you said that, meaningful, of course, oh, if only we could <laughs> become fully meaningful just like that. It's a long, long process, isn't it? But um, we take a step, a step in the right direction. And, well, you know, traditionally this was the purpose of good education, wasn't it? To, to, to set you along the right way towards a good and useful life. And uh, we start off with such simple, basic things as unselfishness. Um, putting other people's first, humility. What practical steps then could you suggest, particularly for younger people with less experience than yourself, in taking these formative steps um, because we are all bombarded with messages of how special the individual self is, if not uh, uh, not only as a consumer, but as a as a subject of selfie selfie rules. Well, use your common sense, my dear. Just observe and question the validity of that statement. You know, see what's the behaviour of people. What, what? Just look at look at people. You know, particularly in our Western world, so often, you know, not only unhealthy, but, um, you know, uh, shut up in their own lost world, walk, going, walking along like bananas with their heads bowed, you know, not present at all, but just lost in some feud past or regretting, uh, sorry, lost in either in some imagined future or regretted past. Um, you know, just say, well, is this, is this really what we are? Is this really, is this individual really so important? Think of yourself. What am I, for goodness sake? One of my very first lessons was a young farmer was to realise how I couldn't walk on the grass without hurting it or crushing the insects or something. I began to 
question myself. I said, what on earth am I, John Butler? Am I really an asset to this world? Or am I just a nuisance? Does nature want me? Of course it doesn't. <laughs> I don't think most people don't want me either. They're not in the slightest bit interested in me. The only person who's interested in me is me. <laughs> most people switch off as soon as I start talking. People are just interested in them themselves, aren't they? Everybody is. So we all talk, 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 and nobody is interested in anybody. <laughs> Not really. We just wait for them to stop so we can start talking again. You question this Western assumption, which is only an assumption that the individual's worth or something. Let me just take you back to a very interesting event in history. You may know that to begin with, uh, the Christian church was, was uh, well, Jesus lived in the Middle East in uh, Palestine. And the, and, and the early Christian church was founded in Constantinople. And, and, uh, and Rome was then a, a sort of a, you know, a branch. Um, and at that time, there was a great argument in the church uh, Christianity, some of you may know, has something called the Creed, in which it says um, spirit. Now spirit, we've talked a lot about spirit, um, proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now the uh, biblical words in the Bible are slightly sort of ambiguous, they can be read different ways. And the Eastern Church has always read that, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, not the Son, the Father, the original. And the Western and Rome like to think of it proceeding from the Father and the Son. And this developed into one of these great arguments, which led to what's called the Great Schism. When in <laughs> 1054, I know that date, <laughs> um, the Western Church separated from what they call the Eastern Church, which is really orthodoxy. And the Western Church developed into what those of us in the West are familiar with. First of all, it was Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, based on the, uh, Rome with the Pope, and then all the various Protestant sects arose from those who protested. They didn't like the Pope, but they wanted to <laughs> run the show more themselves. So there we are. So we have these great big two branches of Christianity. One in which um, you see the spirit, which is the, in, in a way, the, um, the um, you can call the sort of formative energy of, of spirit, proceeds through a man, through Jesus. Whereas in Eastern Church it doesn't. Man is, is uh, he comes straight from God. So throughout a long, slow evolution in the West, this has led to the, to the uh, glorification of man and the great emphasis on individuality which we have in the West with human rights and the rights of the individual and all this sort of thing. Now in the East it's not like this at all. It's quite different, and I know this, I speak from experience because I've lived several years in Russia, and, and uh, when I realized this, it immediately opened a great uh, gate in my understanding. Because in Russia, the individual is, is of course, acknowledged, but it's, uh, he isn't given that same emphasis. This, incidentally, is why East and West never understand each other. Politicians are forever criticizing each other, but they don't understand this fundamental difference in their culture, in their outlook. Now, am I losing the thread of what I was saying? Um, well, th th that's what has arisen in Western culture, you see. Um, I think you'll find that in, certainly in Eastern Christianity, and I think probably throughout much of the rest of the world, um, without, not so uh, rooted in this uh, um, humanistic tradition of the West.
they don't have this emphasis on the individual. So what I've just said to you in the first part of this interview will be more easy to accept. Um, the individual is, is more considered as a part of the whole, not so much standing on his own individual rights, but incorporated in a family or in the village, in the community, uh, where everybody works for the good of the whole rather than the good of the individual. Whereas in, in, uh, in the West, this individual, and because the emphasis is on the individual, which is of course the ego, it's selfish and is the root of all selfishness that is so rampant now in Western society. What's in it for me? My rights, what am I going to do? You know, and the aggression that flows from that. And so just coming back to my question, what practices or uh, can, can young people in particular, younger than us anyway, adopt to, to counterbalance this and, and open up to uh, more than a, a, a separate little me into uh, a broader understanding of the oneness? Well, the first step is to recognise the disease, isn't it? To, to recognise that, that, uh, that this uh, almost, un at least in political practice, political correctness, this unquestionable um, emphasis on the individual is actually very questionable indeed. Um, so question that and then you will begin to see th that you don't have to live that way. Um, I mentioned unselfishness. Well, um, instead of uh, approaching life with what's in it for me attitude, begin to think of well, how can I serve? How can I serve the whole? Which may be humanity, it may be nature. In my case, it was nature. That's how I thought of myself as a farmer, a servant of the land. To leave the land better than I found it. Not to worry about money. Surprisingly enough, I managed, I got my reward. You do, you know, it's, it's very strange. There are more laws than, than uh, one thinks that, uh, that govern what we receive in this world. And study, study the question, think about it, and you'll find openings. It's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, the culture is full of good advice. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the blessing of service, um, giving rather than getting? Yes, yes, I can. Again, I can speak a lot from personal experience. Because it's led me through very much loneliness in my life. Because I didn't want to follow the peer group. Much scorn and misunderstanding. You know, it takes courage to stand on your own, particularly when all those around you are mocking you and saying you're wrong and uh, why can't you just be like other people? I had, I've got an older sister. I remember at one time in my life, her looking across the table at me, at home this was, and with, I won't, to say exactly what was in her tone of her voice, but it wasn't very nice at all, saying, why can't you just be normal? <laughs> why can't you be like other people? But you know, I couldn't. And some of us just can't.
Because again, it takes courage, you see, to, to follow your own, what you feel in your deep heart. Often you just feel that it's wrong. You can't explain it. You can't, uh, you know, our minds aren't developed enough to give a rational explanation for it. So, so people say, well, what's the matter with you? And you can't tell them. But you just know it, it's not what you want in life. It's not right. Try to explain, they'll say, and we can help you. But you can't. They can't help you. You just have to often just go away by yourself. And then, strangely enough, doors open, things happen. Follow your heart, that's good advice. Although I didn't understand that when I was first told that. I thought it was being selfish and I thought that was the last thing one should do. Follow your heart, not your peer group, or what society says you should do. No, my dears, I don't have a recipe for you. I can't say do this or do that. Be true to yourself. This above all to thine own self be true. And it will follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. So said wise Shakespeare many years ago. The advice still holds. But what on earth does it mean to be true to yourself? I didn't understand it when I first heard those words. Well, isn't that, John, the very nub of it? This um, hankering that we all feel, particularly when we are younger, to, to be someone, to, to, uh, to accomplish, to achieve. We're, we're encouraged to follow our dreams. But isn't, isn't the difference whether those dreams have been implanted? They're cuckoos in the nest dreams you want to be a famous celebrity or you want to be a, a, I don't know a, a video star or, <laughs> or, or um, in, in any field you you want to become accomplished and recognized and you're saying um, by all means follow your heart but that's not necessarily uh, the way of the world no, it isn't at all. Well, I suppose, again, we just have to learn by experience and, um, you know, consider these stars. Are they really worth it? What is it? What do they add up to? Don't they all come down to dust in the end, just like you and me? Learn a bit about their lives, are they? As complete as they seem to be, have they got all the answers? Does it make them happy? I came across some th something that uh, the, the World Formula One racing champion driver Lewis Hamilton said just this week that uh, he was disillusioned because uh, the world was in a mess and no amount of his individual uh, conscientious actions uh, seemed to be enough to uh, fix the mess and he was, uh, came across as quite despondent. Well, that's marvellous, isn't it? See, to reach that point is the beginning of maturity. Um, Yes, we all start off like that, wanting, trying to change and, for example, there's this new movement, um, elimination, no, uh, what's it called? Um, Extinction. Extinction Rebellion. Well, as a young man I would have joined that, absolutely. Um, but you see, 
Yes, you, we can diminish the amount of plastic, maybe, and <laughs> probably can't cut down carbon emissions, maybe. Um, but so what? We're all going to, still going to die. Is it going to make people any happier? Is it going to fulfill the ultimate goal of human existence? Aren't we still going to be fighting each other? People have been fighting each other long before plastic was invented or even motor cars were invented. And, you know, it, it, the, there's more to it than meets the eye, literally. And ultimately, um, we need to find the ultimate. Well, we start off with Extinction Rebellion, and God bless them, and, uh, and, and uh, may they do their good work. But uh, there is more. Beyond that, you begin to realize that the greatest pollution in this world is not plastic or, or uh, carbon emissions. It's actually me. It is this ego, this the sin of me. I am the greatest pollution in the world. I, John Butler, this corrupt individual, which is, which in the, uh, thank God, in the mercy of God is condemned to die. I am the cause of the trouble in the world. It's not plastic, it's no good. Even the politicians aren't to blame, it's me. So this is where it starts from. Now then, Swallow that one, my dears, and you're on the way to something better. That's the best thing you can do, is to acknowledge that the fault lies fairly and squarely there. Yeah. Now then, uh, all right, it's, it's not nice to take that on board, but even to a small extent, you can begin to take that on board. And now consider what wise people say. Mm. Just think what it might mean. The less of me, the more is God. Where is God? Look, it's very, very simple. Let me bring us back to here and now. Feet on the floor, bottom of the chair. Just listen. Can you hear the motor cars on the road? Look. Just watching Phil's eyes are blinking the other side of the camera. Now then, just by being present, lo and behold, it opens up to this presence, this, this invisible, indivisible spiritual presence, which is the threshold, you see, of what you can open up into a deeper understanding of what we may call God. Now then, what happens to John Butler in this process? Now his body remains sitting on a chair, but he gets forgotten, doesn't he? And consciousness simply expands into this greater context, which embraces not only the little situation here, but extends beyond the world, beyond the walls, into the valley, and in fact contains the whole world in its infinite completion. You see how immediate and practical it is. And then you come back, oh my God, I forgot something, what's for supper tonight? Or how did you get on with so-and-so, you see? And you forget it. You're back in the world of you and me. Now this is the work. This is the work. This is what I started to do when I was 26 years old. I only just grasped a few sort of tail, tail end feathers at that time. Now I realize it is its infinite completion. Now you're never really too young to begin to get some understanding that there's something operating behind the scenes in this world which is bigger than me. So at first there is this intense loneliness and uh, I, and sort of you know, a sense of failure because you're not like other people. 
but very soon one may begin to feel the comfort that probably comes with us more often being alone than with other people. Some people find it in, in com communities, churches and things. That there is this greater thing and that, you know, in the Bible this is called, it's one of the names given to spirit, which is what I'm talking about, is the comforter. And certainly a feature of this is, it is very comforting. It doesn't speak anything, it, but the, it puts, there's nothing you can see or describe really, but there is a sense of invisible arms that hold you, that you're not alone in this world, you have an invisible friend. Of course, the way it's secret to begin with, if you talk about it to other people, they'll just laugh at you. Well, these things develop slowly in the heart. I was only a very little child when I began to feel this. And gradually as I moved more into the world of man and felt this loneliness and uh, estrangement really from the world of most other people. So I gradually learned to turn more to this invisible comforter which has gone on strengthening throughout my life and finally led me home. Well, dears, you know, you re pick up certain books, you may meet a few individuals in life who encourage you. Often found most encouragement from animals, you know. It's amazing how comforting a dog can be, you know, when all the world's against you, you'll find a dog will still lick your hand. The sun will shine on you, you know, however horrible people are. You know, these are called angels, all these things. Again, people will laugh at you. I wouldn't advise you to go around speaking these out in public. It's all right for me and now people can laugh at me, I don't mind. But if you start talking about them when you're a little boy, people will probably think you're potty, but you're not. See, this invis these natural comforters, one key is that they'll never criticize you. They'll never judge you, they'll never be unkind to you. Most people are endlessly like that, aren't they? So naturally turn to things that are kind to you, that love you. And you find they're the angels that help you go through life. And you'll understand this more as you grow older. Be not afraid. The Lord is with you. It's true.